The humanities are what makes us what we are. I'm not an academic, but I benefit all the time from what academics are thinking and doing in the area of humanities. So today we're seeing the launch of the Being Human Festival. This is the first national festival of the humanities. And what we're trying to do is tell people that they don't have to worry about this word humanities. It's a difficult word. People think they know what a scientist is or an artist is, and they're not quite sure what the humanities is. So instead we just want to show them what we do all around the country, from the Orkney Islands to Truro to Belfast to East Anglia, we have people who are showing the very best that we do in humanities research. We're dealing with every aspect of the human world, and that's exactly what subjects like literature, philosophy, history, archaeology do. So today, at the launch of the festival, we're talking about whether we have too much information, how do we filter it? How do we select what's significant, what's meaningful? And these are exactly the tools that you're given in the humanities to deal with that. I'm going to lead a conversation about propaganda and what it looked like, what it looks like, what we kind of feel about it as a culture. My aim is to talk for a very short time and then other people start talking because I'm not just looking to start the conversation, I also want to mine it for insight. Who's got a question or, or something to say? It's great for me to do research for my work as a journalist because I never ever do anything like this without meeting somebody cleverer than me, more passionate and more interesting. <laughs> One of our events is uh, an AHRC large grant project called Rethinking the Senses. Now here's an obvious example of where you need scientists and humanities researchers, in this case philosophers, to work together. The day is about reminding you that senses are not functioning by themselves but rather together in concert. We have activities ranging from a demonstration with an engineer who can sizzle your tongue to uh, stimulate the sense of citrus. Some of the other tables will show you that in fact smell contributes most of what we call flavour perception. We have various experiments and live demonstrations showing you that in fact the way your food is laid out or in fact the context of the meal, the room you're in or in fact the sounds that are being played very much affect the way you perceive flavour of the dish in front of you. You'll find a lot of my uh, philosophy colleagues seated next to scientists and they will be talking to people today about experiments that they have chosen to run together and because of dialogue that they've had at workshops and seminars. So we really are in an organic process of finding out questions that are common to both of us. One of the objectives of the AHRC is to uh, ensure that a broad public engage with, with humanities research. So this festival, I think, is a great way to open up humanities research to a broader audience, to provide a space where people can think about it, but also come in and engage with it. When I tell people that we're studying chickens, their natural response is to go, ha, 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 ha. What we're interested in, though, is looking at where did chickens come from? Because although nobody pays any attention to them, no one knows anything about chickens either. You know, where were they domesticated? Why were they domesticated? How did they spread around the world? These are things that we don't know the answers to. So our project is trying to investigate all of these different strands. So today, we are taking over Vindolanda Roman Museum. Um, the Romans are kind of a big story when it comes to chickens because although the Romans didn't introduce chickens to Britain, they were responsible for sort of popularising the consumption of chickens. So the Romans are a big story and so we thought it would be great to come to Vindoland at this world famous site and, and kind of take over the museum and weave the chicken story through all of their exhibits. So we've got loads of stuff going on today. I think it's really important to share with a wider audience our passion for the 18th century and the, thing, you know, the things that we do at the university. It was a great opportunity to work with the public of Newcastle and share our research with them. I've been working on actresses for years now um, and the one thing that always comes through is their celebrity and how they're really famous even in their age. There's lots of really interesting stories to tell about actresses um, because they led such interesting lives. If you're walking along the beaches in Sandy, you might sometimes feel that you're being watched. Something in the sea watching you. We have musicologists from Goldsmiths 
working with psychologists and neuroscientists to look at our experience of listening to music. So they're going to be listening to uh, the Birmingham Symphony Orchestra playing a whole series of Wagner's Ring Cycle. And while members of the audience are listening, some of them will be wired up so that they can do heart monitoring, they can register skin conductance, they can get these behavioral and physiological telltale signs of their emotional engagement and reaction. We run an archive at the Institute of Archaeology and we're involved in a huge project to digitise the Victorian lantern slide collection of the university. These are images that haven't been seen by the public or indeed by anybody for up to a hundred years. So what we thought we'd do this evening is put on a Victorian lantern slide performance with musical accompaniment and we're going to be showing off some of our images taking you on a trip from London to Constantinople and trying to recreate for you the sense of wonder that people would have felt in the Victorian period when they saw these images for the first time. It was one of those miserable days in 1880s Oxford. The film is in some cases silvering and they are vulnerable to damage and mould. And if we don't digitise them now, the chance to capture these images and keep these images for the future may be lost. So the challenge of the festival was to think of how we have engaging ways of demonstrating the power, interest and range of what we do under that banner of the humanities. And people have been fantastically innovative. There's a lot of food for thought here, a lot of stuff I agreed with, a lot of stuff I really didn't agree with, but it's just great to be, feel engaged in a debate about things that are affecting modern society really. Results in uh, biology, genetics and neuroscience are partly changing our conception of who we are. It's not just that the scientists are working away on that question, but they're also calling on their colleagues in philosophy in other parts of the humanities to say, we need some context, we need some understanding. Are we able to learn how to understand the future through the past? And for that, you need the kind of scholars and the kind of interpreters that we have in the humanities. Even if you can't see a clear route from the humanity subject into industry, that doesn't mean it hasn't added to the sum of human wisdom. And I think actually one of, the, one of the best things about humanities is that they can give people the language with which to say education is a public good and I don't care whether I've invented graphene or understood a poem. I'm a bigger person and I've made the world bigger. <laughs>